Good morning, all, everybody, all y'all, whatever else word you might want to use for everybody. Uh, I hope I don't have to remind you again that nobody, I didn't hear one phone ring in here yesterday. Thank you. I don't, I'm not going to go through this because you all saw it yesterday, but uh, we're today. This is us today, and we're pleased to have PMI board member Cheryl Walker Wait. I was afraid I was going to say Wait Walker, but uh, I got it right, Cheryl. And uh, we've had been happy to have a PMI board member or equivalent uh, for all seven of these, and also uh, after her, the IPMA after the coffee break. So, Cheryl, come on up. <laughs> I need to just, um, okay. Woo, microphone. Um, well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here this morning. <clears throat> and uh, a Seattle welcome, I can tell. You know, I come from Seattle and raining is all the way, so <laughs> I figured you knew I was coming. <laughs> Hopefully, you like the rain too. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm a first year board member. I was elected last year, so I'm on my, as a three year term, and I begin this year. Um, it's exciting to be back uh, in the university systems and also with the local chapters. I started off in the local chapters. I come out of the D.C. chapter area and uh, served several positions there, uh, finishing up with the, the uh, president. So that was a lot of fun, and I really enjoy that. Um, before uh, coming to the board position, I was actually the chair of the BVAC, the Board Volunteer Advisory Committee. So um, I've had an opportunity to engage with a lot of people now across the way as they choose to uh, become at a national level in their volunteer positions. So um, this morning, uh, I would like to begin with a story that I believe underscores the value of project management. Molly taught aerobics. The 29-year-old mother of two young boys had a strong following in her hometown and made a decent living teaching people how to lose weight and stay in shape. On the weekends when her husband was home with the boys, she liked to run around the lake shore, run along the lake shore. She'd listen to the CD, the rhythm with the pulse of the music, kind of getting lost in that tranquil place. You know how that is when you're out there, just you and nature. Um, and uh, really enjoyed doing that. One day when she was jogging, however, uh, the, she had the sun on her back and the ocean breeze in her face. She failed to see the skateboarder that was coming right at her. Instinctively, she dodged to the left and stepped for a moment in the street, for just a moment. But that's all it took for the gray Mitsubishi to hit her from behind. She went flying over the top, crashed to the, crashed to the pavement. Bystanders rushed to Molly, who was unconscious and bleeding profusely from the gash in the back of her head. Her pulse was weak and growing weaker. And those who gathered around her were beginning to wonder if the EMT, who had been summoned by cell phone, would get there in time. <coughs> when the EMT arrived, it had only been about three or four minutes. But clinically, technically, Molly died. She had a cardiac arrest. The EMT began the process of defibrillation and administering electrocardioshock and revived her heart muscle. With her pulse stabilizing, the EMT began to prepare her for emergency transport to the local hospital. The EMT gave her plasma for her blood loss, put a cervical collar around her neck, had a stint on her left tibia, and of course put her on oxygen. The hospital was notified, notified that Molly was on her way, and the trauma team began its work, stabilizing and preparing her for emergency surgery. It was clear that she had internal bleeding and most likely organ damage. The anesthesiologists, surgeons, and nursing team applied their skills using the most modern tools of their trade including computer-based diagnostics, laser-guided robotics, and anthroscopic techniques. The surgery lasted seven hours, but Molly's organs were saved, her bleeding stopped, her compound fracture repaired, and her other wounds salved. Two months later, Molly began the process, extensive process, of physical therapy. It lasted about 18 months, but today she teaches aerobics to an even larger crowd and jogs with barely a hitch in her step, although she does restrict it to the track at the local junior college. 
A happy ending to what could have been a tragic story, and one of literally happy endings every year. But why was Molly's ending happy? Well, no doubt, because of her own perseverance, the quick action of a few strangers, and divine providence, to be sure. But most notably, because of the hidden hand of project management. What? Project management? What are you talking about? What's that have to do with this? Well, let's take a look at it. Without a cell phone to call to 911, Molly would have died on the pavement within minutes. But how do cell phones get here? Well, we can thank Bell Labs, Motorola, IBM, and a host of other cellular phone and mobile phone technology specialists. It was the management of a whole litany of projects over half a century that gave us the cell phone technology. It was AT&T and a whole host of satellite providers that brought us the 911 emergency system. With collaboration of tens of thousands of local emergency districts, all put in place because of successful project management. EMT training was developed and is administered using true and tried project management tools and techniques, just as the medical and surgical training, equipment, and technology, from the defibrillator to the intravenous tubes, you name it. It's there because of a project life cycle. Hospitals were built according to project plans, milestones, and deliverables. Contracts were signed because of negotiation skills. Corporate execs oversaw managers who managed contractors, unions, builders, and a whole host of stakeholders. The hidden hand of project management was behind every step of the process that saved Molly's life, rehabilitated her, gave her back her future, and gave her family back their wife, mother, daughter, and sister. When the EMT found Molly, she had no pulse, but they revived her and her pulse was strong. So is the pulse of our profession, strong and vibrant. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the pulse of the project management profession. Since 2006, PMI has been conducting the annual pulse of the profession. It's an industry's annual global benchmark for project, program, and portfolio management. So why is it of value? Because it charts major project management trends, features original market research, reports feedback and insights from program, project, and portfolio managers around the world, includes an analysis of third-party data, such as from WIPRO, IBM, PwC, offers insights from multinational organizations and governments and practitioners from around the world. This study really provides organizations and practitioners with the information they need to become more globally competitive, particularly in this turbulent economic reality. In April, for example, the IMF downgraded the US growth from 2 to 1.7. Kiplinger agreed with that rating. However, he still feels it will have more of a modest growth going forward, although unstable. So to stay competitive in this economy, there's an increased pressure to manage resources, the ability to anticipate a shifting horizon, to have the structures and talent development in place, to have solid stakeholder management processes, and standardization and aligning projects with program and strategy. That's how we manage uncertainty. And that's our future. So are you ready for the changing demands and expectations of tomorrow's project managers? Are you ready to demonstrate to your companies how you can help them stay competitive and be ahead of the competition? when only 53% of projects actually complete on time. Only 57% are actually on budget, and globally, 17% fail outright. Can you relate what you do every day to the delivery of project goals for your company? Only 62% of projects actually meet goals. Do you have the skills your organizations are demanding now for tomorrow's projects? The pulse of the profession shows the reason for project failure often is due to inaccurate requirements gathering, that's a surprise, changing priorities, poor communications, and resource constraints. And we have found that there's 135 million at risk for every billion that is spent. That's a 13.5% potential loss. I don't know about your organization, but I don't know any organization that can sustain a 13.5% loss every year. And in fact, the pulse of the profession has found that low-performing organizations spend 14 times more on projects than high performers. A quick look at the recent news illustrates the uncertainties that every organization faces as a continued economic insecurity. 
which drives, of course, the need to become a high-performing organization. In the US, we have an economy that continues to expand, but at a moderate and unstable rate. In Europe, the Cyprus financial crisis, continued Eurozone austerity, and Moody's just downgraded Britain's credit rating. In Asia, North Korea saber rattling, a lack of external demand for Japanese goods, and in Europe, a decreased demand for Chinese and US exports. In the Middle East, of course, we have continued unrest. All of this underscores that organizations are operating in volatile economic and political environment. Surviving and thriving in this environment requires getting better at project, program, and portfolio management. Economic pressures make it critical for organizations to accomplish more with fewer dollars. High performers do everything they can to minimize the risk by improving their project and program performance. And yet, only 8% of organizations are considered high performers. What's it mean to be a high performer? 80% of your projects come in on time, within budget, according to specification, and deliver business value and meet those goals. <clears throat> high performing organizations create efficiencies and drive organizational success and effectiveness. And they focus on three different things. A talent management, support standardized project management, and drive strategic alignment. And what does that mean? Well, in terms of focusing on talent management, this isn't just a couple of courses. These folks have a formal development process, an ongoing training, and a defined career path for project and program managers. In terms of supporting standardized project management, this is standardized pro practices throughout the organization, active project sponsors and PMPs. And in terms of driving strategic alignment, this is the maturity of your program, portfolio, and project management processes, benefits realization, and high organizational agility. So now that you have an idea of the focus of high-performing organizations, I'm going to share with you an example of a low-performing organization in contrast. Everybody always tells you, here's what the greatest projects do. Well, let's hear about what the less-than-greatest projects do. We recognize that some projects require the agility, experience, and improvisational talents that high-performing organizations can bring to the table, without which, of course, you have massive cost overruns, schedule delays, and even loss of contracts. Here's a true story from my own experience. I call it the case of the KG customer. And of course, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Jack was assigned to oversee a portion of a major change initiative. Jack's company, a low-performing organization called Carefree Consulting, CareCon, was the primary vendor on the contract with a staff of about 12 people, and they were overseen by a partner and a senior project manager, Jill. Jack reported to Jill. <laughs> the Watch Your Back Corporation was in second position on the contract. They had six staff members and an associate partner. The client, Sludge Clean Incorporated, SCI, provided wastewater collection and treatment for all of the residential and commercial entities within seven different states. SCI was profitable. They were reasonably efficient and well-managed. A federal regulatory agency issued a series of rules governing wastewater treatment intending to improve the environment that would mean a significant change in business practices and infrastructure for SCI. SCI fought the rules and using its power and lobbying influence was able to persuade the regulatory agency to support an independent study. If the study showed that SCI could not return its investment within three years, a three-year ROI, then the regulations would be suspended and alternative solutions to the environmental concerns explored. When CARICON began the study, its partner and project manager envisioned a long-term opportunity for the company once the study was complete and the change initiative had begun. Jill met with SCI officials and, and sketched out ways that CARICON could support the change initiative. Watch Your Back was surprisingly silent on the question. As the weeks went by, Jack began to sense something was amiss. He could not put his finger on it, but one by one, SCI complained about CARICON personnel, poor communications, poor people skills, poor performance, and one by one, CARICON's numbers began to dwindle. In the meantime, a Watch Your Back staffer had confided in Jack that his company was certain 
that SCI was intent on orchestrating the outcome of the feasibility study. They didn't want to conform to the regulations. When CARECON was pushing a long-term relationship with SCI, assuming that the change initiative would go forward, Watch Your Back accurately understood the political landscape, aligned its own efforts to show how SCI would suffer a dramatic financial reversal if they had to comply, and they were quietly maneuvering to gain first position on the contract. Jack shared this with Jill. Jill refused to believe it. Meanwhile, the staff continued to shrink, and surprisingly, Watch Your Back's footprint grew. Nine months into the project, SCI exercised a rescission clause and canceled the contract with CARECON. Shocking. Anyone care to speculate which company assumed prime position and ultimately put forth a study that gave SCI an exemption from the requirements? So why did the project run significantly over budget behind schedule and actually lost the contract in the end? There are three key reasons. First, lack of standardization and active sponsorship. The primary decision makers would not think outside the box, utilize standard practices, nor secure an active sponsor within SCI or CARECON. Past practices and experiences had taught them that the federal rules and regulations could not be avoided and that their initial analysis had shown that SCI could probably get an ROI in three years. They never thought to question whether SCI's public position to manage an objective independent study could be different from its genuine position. The partner and Jill were so wedded to the potential for a long-term contract and the resulting positives for CARECON and themselves that they were blinded to the political realities. Second, no focus on talent management. Subordinates were neither trusted nor empowered. Information flowed from top down. People were let to know things on a need-to-know basis. Staff was discouraged from using their own expertise or experience to manage their piece of the project. There was no skill development, no career path, no PMPs. This ensured that Jill and the partner's perspective were the only ones employed. Finally, a lack of organizational agility and benefits realization. Their inflexibility in both process and mind prevented Jill and the partner from reacting swiftly and creatively when crises struck. Having no clue as to SCI's real objectives not seeing through Watch Your Back's maneuvering, and ignoring information and evidence that CARECON's position was slipping, Jill and the partner were thunderstruck when the contract was canceled. They were even more thunderstruck when they were canceled a year later. This illustrates the value and importance of focusing on talent management, supporting standardized project management, and driving strategic alignment for project performance. It also really underlines the need for stakeholder management. So to be competitive, organizations need to increase their project program and portfolio performance. In today's volatile and uncertain business environment, being technically competent just gets you in the game. This really good news, bad news story. The good news is that around the globe, in all economies, there's a greater recognition of the value of project and program management as a profession. Organizations everywhere are highly focused on investing in project management as the strategic competency that it is. Last fall in Chennai, PMI's India team told a standing room only audience that the Indian government had specifically called out project management as a strategic competency in its 12th fifth year plan. This is India's guiding document for government activity and resource allocation. The Indian government now recognizes that project management as a capacity and as a learnable profession and one that can be institutionalized, become part of the government's project and program DNA. It's phenomenal, but it's not unique. We're seeing this kind of emphasis happen all over the world. The US government has implemented an IT program management job classification. The UK has established a Master Projects Leadership Academy to improve project success. The US Department of Veterans Affairs saved $290 million by implementing standardized project management training. The CSC uses the PMP in their talent development framework. The Canadian Comptroller General uses the PMBOK as an independent reference document. And legislation in South Korea tells you how to put together a PMO. 
The other good news for you as individuals is the study showed that in a three to 15 year time frame of an individual's work experience, that PMPs actually earn $123,000 more than non-PMPs. Well, heck, that's worth the $500 testing investment, right? <laughs> and in fact, they're saying that there's gonna be 2.3 million new jobs in the US by 2020 in project and program management. Awesome. 15.7 million new jobs globally. That's one and a half million new jobs a year. And by 2020, the economic impact will exceed 18 trillion across seven project intensive industries. The bad news is there's not enough people to fill the needs. And it's just not warm bodies who can walk and chew gum at the same time, who generally don't do that very efficiently. Organizations are telling us that there's not enough project and program managers with the right skills that they need for tomorrow's PMs. This presents both an opportunity and looming disaster. Today's executives are demanding a focus on skills that support their strategy for the next three to five years not people who can solve issues from a year or two ago. This goes beyond technical competence. That's just considered the basics. What they're looking for in the next generation project manager is someone who is a technical project manager with strategic business management and leadership acumen, all three, the triangle. And organizations are telling us that 90% of those organizations say that technical skills are the most difficult to find, but quite honestly, the easiest to train. And 66% of the organizations are saying that leadership skills and the business acumen is most critical to early project success, but the most difficult to train. Members of our Global Executive Council have told us what the most important skills are for tomorrow's project managers. Alignment to vision, integrity, the ability to influence stakeholders, negotiation skills, the ability to inspire, the ability to not only have a vision, but to communicate it. Where do your strengths lie? Corn Ferry, the world's largest executive recruiting organization, identifies other skills that are critical. The, the ability to deal with ambiguity, creativity, the ability to manage innovation, strategic agility, planning skills, the ability to motivate others, a talent for building effective teams, and being able to manage vision and purpose. Where are your opportunities for development? Floor, a global construction and engineering firm out of Irvine, Texas, considers talent development integral to their competitive advantage. To ensure that the global portfolio of project professionals will satisfy future needs, the company seeks its five to 10 year strategic plan with its development plan, its talent development plan. A PMI Global Executive Council member, Floor tracks whether its current employees have the training, certifications, and experience to take on future projects, and then they hire for the gaps. But Floor also creates targeted learning opportunities for high-performing employees to nurture their technical and leadership skills that they need to succeed. This company wants to be around in 100 years, and talent development is how they intend to do it. Floor demonstrated the kind of strategic planning that is particularly critical. True talent management means establishing an enterprise-wide career track and focusing on these areas. The study, the Pulse of Profession study, found that high performers, 73%, have training on the use of tools and techniques. Low performers, only 48%, which really surprised me, because I thought if you had anything, you'd teach people how to use the tools, right? 68% of high performers have a defined career path for project managers, and process to mature portfolio and PM practices. Low performers, only a quarter or a third. And high performers have a process to develop PM competency, 61%, less than a third low performers. The Pulse research data clearly shows a higher rate of projects completed on time, within budget, and according to specifications for those organizations that focus on talent development. PwC's third global survey on the current state of project management showed that 67% of the respondents agreed that project management training contributes to business performance. Booz and Company's annual Global Innovation 1000 research confirmed that the performance drivers of innovation are not about how much money an organization invests in innovation, but rather the quality of their talent, processes, and decision making. 
of course, as well as how they spend their resources. Talent management and decision making are the pillars of project management, making it a key framework through which to innovate. The other thing that we looked at was the role of a career path and its impact, correlation, if you will, on project completing on time within budget and according to specification. Those organizations that had a career path showed a 71% of meeting goals for their projects, 63% within budget, and 61% on time. And there's a 10 to 20% deviation if you don't have a career path. The odds are in your favor to have the career path. Organizations that effectively align talent management and organizational, to organizational strategy conduct talent management differently. They're more likely to offer employees multiple forms of talent management and have talent management programs around training and development, such as providing training and soft skills, making training a priority, and developing an evolved talent program. They're more likely to have multiple project management career paths, one where you can be elevated to a higher level project manager, greater visibility, more expensive projects, more complex, or you can take an executive route and become an executive with a PMP. They're more likely to have integrated talent management across the organization using various methods, including performance management, learning and training, leadership development, and recognition awards. They're more likely to measure both financial and non-financial talent management outcomes that affect an organization's ability to remain strategically aligned with its goals and values. We've noted that an effective organizational strategy is to recruit people with leadership skills and then train them in the technical areas. We're seeing that these leadership soft skills are absolutely critical competencies that will be most in demand as organizations are telling us. We're seeing this already in both business and government. The UK's major projects leadership academy, IBM's delivery partners, and Siemens' project categorization scheme. In the old model, organizations would look for a technical person who could just deliver on the WBS. In today's model, they're looking for people with leadership and business skills and really effective stakeholder management techniques. And then they train them on the technical areas. Remember, organizations said that 90% find it, the technical skills the most difficult to find, but the easiest to train. And 66% said that leadership skills are the most critical in early project success, but the most difficult to train. So, <clears throat> I've mentioned Siemens. Let's look at how Siemens identifies, trains, and aligns the right project manager to the right project. <clears throat> Siemens is a complex global powerhouse with around 370,000 employees worldwide. Obviously, talent development is critical. Siemens starts with an automated project categorization process that evaluates the project's complexity, resources required, and strategic implications, both for the customer and for Siemens. The kinds of things they look at is, is the first time the organizations have worked together. Uh, what are the re compliance requirements, technical specifications or difficulty, schedule, and commercial risk. Each project is then assigned a letter from A to F. F projects are the most simple. They're about 250,000, automation, simple terms, repeat customer. An A project is a large and complex project, such as a fossil, <coughs> fossil power plant. Or, for example, building the London Array off the coast of England, which will soon be the world's largest offshore power plant. Siemens also has job profiles for project managers, which determine which skills, certifications, and experiences are required to manage projects of each categorization. There's a match set for each project to ensure that the right project manager is set up with the right project to maximize success. They look at both the PMP and Siemens internal project management certification. Now, if you're a PMP, you can manage an E or F project, but you have to have both Siemens PM certification and be a PMP to manage projects from A through F. This is an organization that takes talent development very seriously. Hearing about Siemens' approach to talent, talent development and considering where you are in your own professional development and positioning, we see that to be successful and to create tomorrow's project managers, the organization and the individual need to work together. This is a fundamental shift. We're pretty good at managing projects, but are we good at managing change? 
Your organization will be looking for project and program managers who can manage change initiatives via projects and programs. Of course, your organization has a responsibility to help you learn to lead as well as manage, but all strategic change will happen through projects and programs. This means that leading will become more important than managing. So the pulse that is embedded within the hidden hand of project management is strong and getting stronger. And the need for talented and diverse project managers is only growing. You see, when people want to know what is the value of project management and why we put so much emphasis on certifications and experiences and methodologies and pin box and processes and everything, I simply ask them, tell me, give me an example of where what is successful hasn't been the result of a successful project. Look around you and tell me if you see anything. What you wear, how you communicate, how we travel, communications alone, is all the result of a successful project. Oops, sorry about that. Um, the hidden hand of project management. And it's been around since the beginning of time. Remember Noah and the ark? God gave him the project and the specs and the deadline. <laughs> Noah had to put his project team together, scope, schedule, budget, not sure he had a Gantt chart, and get that ark up and running before the rains came, which I'm pretty sure Noah came from Seattle. <laughs> The hidden hand of project management in its infancy. And now our hidden hand is everywhere. Building, discovering, protecting, educating, and even saving lives. You are part of a proud and powerful profession. You're no longer just delivering on a project plan. Project management is now part of strategic implementations. Project management has the potential to be elevated to that of a doctor or a lawyer. Something your children will grow up and say, I want to be a project manager, based on your excellence. I'm a second generation PMP, and it's my fervent hope, and I plan to manage it as such, that my 21 month old son will grow up to be a PMP in his chosen profession and follow in his grandfather, who he's named after, and mother's footsteps. And given the fact that he attended the North America Congress in Vancouver with me last year, and we got a picture out in front of the, the booths, I think he's well on his way. So where do you go from here? Take a moment to consider your capabilities as they relate to the future needs of the profession. PMI can help you assess gaps in your own skills portfolio. Realize that improving and expanding your skills is an ongoing development, one that can make you the next generation project manager. Through the advancements like an online knowledge portal, expanded certification and standard offerings, enhanced mobile My PMI capabilities, you and your peers have easy access to resources that make it easy to upgrade your skills. You have the tools, resources, and now the insight to become the next generation project manager. You can demonstrate the difference between spending time and money and spending time and money with value and purpose. After all, as Molly has shown, and the pulse of the profession emphasizes, it's the hidden hand of project management that underlies success. I never speak for an hour and 15 minutes. There's lots of time for questions or more coffee, as you so choose. <laughs> yes? A couple of things you touched on. Would you see what level or executive level uh, I was asking about uh, executive level PMPs, just whether you're seeing that as a trend. You know, um, for the last 10, 15 years, um, Davidson Frame wrote a book mini books, he's one of my protégés, or I'm one of his protégés, <laughs> get that in the right order. Um, I went to GW, so he introduced me to project management and <laughs> turned my life around. Um, and yes, what we're seeing is because projects are so critical to not only organizational success and your your day to day, but they're also becoming critical to strategic implementation to really understand what's going on. There's increased value for your C-level people to become PMP and really understand what they're asking about, not just is it on schedule or within budget. The follow-on question I had was about uh, training dollars, you, the talent development. You touched on that. Um, what I'm seeing is that the budget dollars are shrinking. Um, I was just wondering what you're seeing. Um, yes, the actual dollar outlay as far as face-to-face -face classes, 
But for example, I also work for IBM, and we have a 40 hour, it's called Think 40. And uh, our Ginny Remenet, our um, CEO, has required all of us to get 40 hours of education this year in whatever. But the way that you get it, the methods and, and techniques are very low cost. So we're doing online classes, we're doing seminars, you can read a book. You know, so that's what I'm seeing happening. The, the professional development, you are the company of one. You need to stay current just for your own thing, but there are effective, cost-effective ways of doing that to stay current without doing the face-to-face -face classes, which actually are the most expensive. Yes? Why did PMI commission this survey for uh, uh, executives? The title says, Why Good Strategies Fail, Lessons for the C-Suite. Okay. Well, you know, our R&D department is always looking for opportunities uh, for research and development, as the pulse of the profession is. And one of the things that we're focusing on is creating greater value for executives from project to program. Um, and portfolio management obviously aligns with that. So th these kinds of studies are all geared toward that to, to demonstrate that project management is not just your TV repairman coming in and plugging something in and being efficient at it, that it really is integral to the success of the organization and for strategy. This survey really tells a picture about where the executives are missing in action in that regard. Yep, and, and, and you know, both the board and PMI, you know, the, the operations, are working to align that. And you'll see, we have these books that come out. Well, they have books that come out. <laughs> I don't produce the books, but um, you'll see one on portfolio management. Um, the change management just came out. The whole PMBOK update on stakeholder management. CEOs are key to that. Anything else? Does that, does that answer your question? Is that good? Okay, cool. Anything else? <laughs> so you mentioned about career paths, but uh, at least from my experience and, the, and what I look into, there still isn't much career path to find up outside of sort of the portfolio management level like the next step steps up. Can you address that? What are, I guess, what's PMI from the goal perspective seeing? Is that really being a trend? Are there some defined project? Wow, they snuck right up on <laughs> Isn't that kind of cool when you're mic'd? Are they, uh, yeah, I thought, wow, my voice got a lot <laughs> booming. But yeah, can you talk about that? Sure. Um, I think it depends on the organization, obviously, right? So we, I did the example of Siemens. They're very much into career pathing. Floor is into career pathing. IBM is into career pathing. And, and it's actually really rigorous. Um, uh, just like when you have in the government where you're a band whatever, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever the numbers are, IBM does the same kind of thing. We have a banding thing, and you have to show experience and education, and you have to show that you're actually capable of the next band before you're elevated to that. So I think it really depends on the organization. I, not as much in smaller and medium-sized companies because, you know, they're limited bandwidth to do that kind of thing, but PMI can help career path you. Quite honestly, when I got my MBA, I hadn't really managed any projects officially, but PMI said, hey, volunteer, lots of enthusiasm, high energy, come on, come manage projects. And so I did, I started, that's, I got involved in the local chapter, and from that experience, I was able to uh, parlay that into work experience and show that I, demonstrate that I could do it. So that's, I mean, that's a weird way to get into a career path, is volunteer, but it's workable. Does that answer your question? You were, you were nice. Uh, two questions. Uh -huh. Usually when you hear the phrase, we, we can't find enough of this quote unquote skilled labor, like when Bill Gates says, I can't find enough skilled engineers, it usually means I can't find enough skills engineer, skilled engineers at the price that I want to pay. True, <laughs> true. Um, so has that been taken into account into some of the studies here? And I guess a, a second part of the question, I, I've got a, a, a new engineer who's we're grooming to be a project manager. So what would you advise as far as training? What, what's, what's the best thing to go? Okay. But I don't think a PMI boot camp is probably the, the best, you know, a PMP boot camp is the way to start. I mean, what, what would you recommend? Okay, so um, on the first question, uh, what was the first question again? <laughs> I'm focused on boot camp. <laughs> oh, none of the skills, right, right, right. Okay, so um, yes, there is definitely a increased shift of offshoring as project management becomes really 
exciting and, and hot and heavy, like in Latin America, for example. It's strong in India, of course, but you're really seeing a boom in Latin America right now. Um, and there's the expectation that you can manage things remotely overseas. And to some extent, you can. I mean, there are virtual projects, no question. Um, but what they're trying to deviate from, remember how we went through COBOL and Siebel and all these other programming tools and, and C++, all that jazz? That's what's happening. Somebody who just knows how to deliver on a WBS or a schedule is kind of like a COBOL programmer. That's nice, but we can now demand more. Um, there's actually, I actually have a paper out there um, in PMI on the entrepreneurial dimension of project management. And um, the, the nature of an entrepreneur is not that of a project manager. <laughs> But the organizations are now saying, hey, I can get somebody who's multifaceted, who can think like an entrepreneur, but manage like a project manager. And that's what's different, is as, as education and resources become more ubiquitous and attainable, that we can get it from everywhere, the expectation of the organization increases. So that's why the talent shortage, um, it's not that people aren't capable, but they're like, oh, goodness sakes, really? I have to, you know, take my Saturdays to start learning something. <laughs> I'd rather go play baseball. Um, so, so that's how things are changing from that perspective. In terms of your engineer, definitely get them involved on tactical. I, I actually teach in two different universities as well in their master's project management programs uh, online. <laughs> and um, uh, what we're seeing is that project management is really big in the engineering field as far as their elective courses that they take, and so getting them exposed to what are the requirements and then getting them tangibly involved in it. Um, as, as you know, my model for, for adult learners is you see me do something, uh, and I tell you about what I'm doing, and then we do it together, and then I watch you do it. And, and that kind of model, uh, children learn a million things a day. They're sponges, right? But they're not evaluating it. That's the difference. That's why adults take longer to learn is because of our analytic uh, nature, so we're assessing everything we're learning and saying, do I really believe this? Is this really efficient? Well, that kind of slows down your learning process compared to a sponge, right? Um, but certainly, there's a direct alignment to engineering and project management. So there's a, there's there should be a glove and fit, hand and hand and glove fit for that. Does that help? Yes. yes. Uh, it's kind of more of a comment rather, you know, about the uh, career. Uh, for a project manager, mm -hmm. uh, it's been my experience as a project manager that I've had to s set my own career path because of the nature of project management is projects end. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to kind of define for yourself what the next steps are and kind of keep moving in a direction. I guess I'm just kind of, you know, are you of the same kind of mindset? Oh, absolutely. Um, you own your own career. I mean, the ultimate responsibility is yours. I started off as a DJ. <laughs> I love the microphone. <laughs> so how many DJs do you know become project managers, right? And I'm really into theater. That's the other thing. I was in all these musicals in high school and college. Sound of music, yes. And um, uh, I found that waiting tables in a restaurant, waiting for my big break, wasn't my thing, wasn't my cup of tea. So I went into business performance art. My point is you can take project management into anything you do, and you can take it creatively. I've put project management into organizations that are like, are you kidding me? I don't have time for that. And in fact, have actually been called in as a consultant to be a project cheerleader, rah, rah, um, because they saw it as tedious, paperwork, boring, dumb. You know, just let me, I'm an engineer out in the field, let me go build a pipeline. I don't want to deal with your stupid papers, right? So it's all a matter of positioning. And most of the projects I manage our organizational change initiatives, and I have the change management part of it and the learning strategies part of it. And then I get my technical guys who literally know the technology or the pipeline or whatever, because I do a lot with engineers to do that aspect of it. But yeah, you, if you look at my resume, you're like, wow, how did she ever get from DJ to you know, board of directors PMI? <laughs> That is not a standard career path. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. It, it, many roads will take you there. It's progressively elaborate. Right? Exactly right. Exactly. And actually, I think it makes you more well-rounded. My undergrad degree was industrial relations psychology. And then I had 750 minors. I loved learning. <laughs> but I always figured it helped you understand the organization. And that's the whole point. I mean, projects are integral to organizational success. It's the hidden hand. Yes. I don't know which one. Your call. Um, you mentioned earlier, it, it 
when you were giving the one response. When you were giving the one response about how some of the engineers take uh, project management classes as electives, I'm wondering, do you, where do you see the profession going? Do you see it being where it's a specialized project manager, somebody who kind of has that as a direct career path, or do you see it becoming a skill that everybody's expected to have and that the specialized project manager disappears over time and that's the expectation that if you're an engineer, you know it, if you're a, you know, a, a executive, you know it, that whatever it is you are, you, you, that's a skill set just like reading and writing and other things. How many people are good at managing checkbooks and budgets? They don't teach it in school, yet you're expected to know it, right? That's, I see an aspect of project management like that in everything you do. Every bottom line, core, what's a scope, what's a schedule, what's a budget, how do I manage? But as you saw with the next generation, that isn't something you just take a class on. The whole leadership and the strategic alignment, the technical project manager, knowing your technology, sure, right? But what I see happening is that everyone will have this core acumen, this core understanding of what it means to be on a project and what the expectations are. But that your project leaders will evolve to something that's more of an executive project leader. That that's will be the new norm, if you will. Uh, you should definitely see this with OPM3 and the different certifications that PMI is coming out with. It, um, and if you look at the foundation, educational foundation, they're actually putting project management in schools and doing project-based learning. So kids, there was this really cool course I took when I was in college. Um, it was, um, I don't know exactly what they called it, but they, they took science and history and math and all, the, and all these major topic areas and gave it to you in a semester and taught it in a Socratic method, like you were way back in the day, right, um, of Plato time. Um, the idea was that you'd have a full understanding of how these things integrated, right? versus a math class and a history class, and a, you know, which are totally separate. That's what I see happening in project management, personally, is that there'll be this core understanding of how to be on a project and maybe even how to manage smaller projects, but this complexity, that's gonna be like Plato and Socrates, you know, I mean, maybe we won't all be a Plato or Socrates project manager, but it'll be that kind of thing where you have to be this more well-rounded, overall arching executive type position. Does that help? <laughs> Thank you. Um, as some of the speakers have said, and I think I saw, saw it on your slide as well, project managers are no longer just expected to manage a project. They need to be strategic thinkers as well. Uh, a lot of our customers look at us to advise on best practices, how to make their projects more efficient. I wanted to, un I wanted to know what's your take on it and what, as P in the same line of thought, how is PMI thinking of uh, recommending uh, this to, to uh, the test takers and other project managers? Well, as the study that this gentleman pointed out shows, PMI definitely understands the need to reposition project management, that it's just not down here, that it really needs to be up in the C-suite, and they're doing that via programs and portfolio management. Those are the two things that executives are more familiar with. Um, so definitely heading in that direction. And, and uh, I draw on my own experience not to say I'm all that in a bag of chips, woohoo, but just because then you know it's real and I can tell you what I've experienced, right? So in the engagements that I've managed, um, there's always been a salesperson who led the sale of it, right? And then I came in to lead the initiative, but it's always been more than just deliver software or something like that. It's always been how do we integrate this and how do we then improve efficiencies and, and, and every engagement I've ever been on started off as like a $50,000 assessment, right? And evolved into a multi-million, multi-year thing because of, I'm an entrepreneur who happened to become a project manager. And, and that's why I wrote the paper on it, right? So it's like, woo, uh, it made sense to me, right? So that's what I see happening a lot is because you need to do more with less and we can't have an entrepreneur and a project manager and a salesperson and a client executive no one's gonna pay for all that, right? So, and, and besides that, if you have the integration and understand how all these things are coming together, you're in a better position to help get the client to visualize what's possible. I've always said, give them what they want and eventually, or give them what they, let's see, how, did I, how do I say that? Give them what they need, give them what they want. Give them what they, anyway, the wants and needs kind of thing, whatever they articulate they want, you give them that, but, but that's not what they really need, right? You know what they really need, but they can't see that yet until they see things evolve. So that, and, but you, ha you can't be arrogant about it. 
I've seen so many people who either have the credentials or the experience or whatever, and they believe that they're smarter than the client. Well, we're all smarter in something, right? And the client certainly is smarter in their business than we will ever be because it's their business, right? If you're just coming in as a consultant. Um, so it's really creating that strategic partnership mindset with the client that you're there to help them win. If they win, you win, and we all win. It's that kind of thing. And, and treating them in a collegial fashion as an advisor even, and but also being willing to roll up your sleeves. I mean, I've done the overnights and the status reports, and I'm a meeting, meeting minute fanatic, right? Well, yeah, I started off as a legal secretary, so I call on those 85 words a minute skill, which probably is not that good anymore, but <laughs> I know people who type 120. Um, but it's being able to fill all those positions. And if you think of it, in, in, in my case, if you think of it as an entrepreneur, they do all the, they wear all the hats, right? So they do all the things to make the whole thing successful. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Uh, PMI operates our PMI uh, symposia, now the PMI congresses. They are now operating in the second year now in San Diego, will be the PMO symposia, the second year of the PMO symposia. Mm -hmm. uh, why did they separate the, the concept of dealing with and promoting and providing information on PMOs from the PMI uh, congress? And then what is the difference in the style of people or the backgrounds of people that PMI sees attending the two events? I have my opinion on that, but I was wondering what yours are uh, setting on the board. Okay. Um, my understanding of why we specialize in different, um, I don't know if subsets is the right word, but you know, they're not trying to separate PMI from PMO, but there was an increased demand for PMO, and they're trying to regionalize to make things more accessible to people. I mean, it's tough for people to necessarily get to the North American or EMA. I got to attend the first EMEA conference in Turkey this year only because I was on the board. Uh, the time and money to get over there from the US, unless your company's gonna pay for it, is, is hefty, right? Um, and we used to have an Asia and a Latin America one, but they didn't have a high enough turnout. What, and it wasn't because it wasn't of interest. Um, what we found culturally is that if you had it in Singapore, everybody from that country came. They didn't come from the other Asian countries. If you did it in Brazil, everybody from Brazil came, but they didn't come from the other Latin American countries. So they were losing the value of putting them down there. So now they do these regional events. And so the PMO regional event comes out of the surveys that say, hey, this is really neat and of high demand, and if you could focus on PMO. As far as the difference in audience, I'm not um, specifically, I don't know specifically what the difference is. I don't know that I've seen a statistic that says, you know, all partners or consultants or academicians go to one versus the other. What I've seen in the Congress is, is it's pretty widespread. My experience from 1978 forward on PMI Congresses is about the same scope of people here, which are middle managers and people in that. Yeah. My experience of last year's PMO uh, Symposia was I was dealing with middle managers up through CEOs because I did a lot of networking at that event yep. with respect to the that's work awesome. we're doing. And that. so what I'm seeing is a difference, and I brought that up on my papers here, is that I'm seeing a difference is that the people attending the PMO event are really, you're, you're reaching the executive, the people you're talking about here, the leadership of the PMO. But through my whole years, I've never seen those people reached at the PMI symposium or conference. Well, if you think about the way the Congress is, because I'm back in the day of um, the, um, what do we call it, Council of Chapter Presidents, right? Way back. I mean, I've been with PMI now for 20 years. Yes, I am that young. Um, I started when I was five. And um, <laughs> I was born to be a project manager. Um, actually, what's really cool is my very first Congress was Vancouver 20 years ago. And come... Satan's Palace or High Water, I was going to get to that Congress. And I joined EDS, a brand new employee there, and I told my boss, this is my goal. This is where I want to be. And he says, okay, well, if you propose a paper and they accept it, then we'll do it. Tom Block was my boss. And we got one, a mentor-protege program. Very fantastic. And then 20 years later, to come back as a board member, I mean, I was flabbergasted. Board members are these people that floated, you know? You know? <laughs> I was like, woo! Um, anyway, so um, I know there's a real emphasis um, on the Congresses you know, the Leadership Institute, that, that they're, that's their real target audience, is the Leadership Institute, and we're evolving. And that when you're talking about career development, 
somewhere over there. That's another thing you can go through is the Leadership Institute is a really good career pathing. I think it was the lady asked about career pathing. Really good career pathing option. I'm a Leadership Institute graduate also. Um, I was in the inaugural class. And uh, uh, that's really the focus is, is to get better volunteer leaders and better uh, uh, project managers in the field. Not that they don't open their doors to the others, but as we try to reposition, and whether it's a branding thing or just a new book or a new audience or a new symposium, we're trying to get executives who aren't aware of how integral this is to their organizational success and strategy. We're trying to give them forms where they can do that. The Corporate Executive Council is a perfect example, right? That's all corporate exec type people. But does that help? Does that answer? Awesome. Actually, I go by CJ, PMI the DJ. Thinking, huh? <laughs> yeah. we, we, we appreciate you coming. Thank you kindly. And, you know, I was reminded of something we used to have many years ago, a VHS tape. Yes. The name of it was, you pack your own chute. <laughs> yeah. So you better do a good job of packing your chute if you're going to use it to jump off an airplane. I agree. Thank Absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs>